The Wonderful Wizard of Oz by L. Frank Ball. Chapter 22 The Country of the Quadling. The four travelers passed through the rest of the forest in safety, and when they came from its gloom, saw before them a steep hill covered from top to bottom with great pieces of rock. That will be a hard climb, said the scarecrow, but we must get over the hill nevertheless. So he led the way, and the others followed. They nearly reached the first rock when they heard a rough voice cry out, Keep back! Who are you? asked the scarecrow. Then a head showed itself over the rock, and the same voice said, This hill belongs to us, and we do not allow anyone to cross it. But we must cross it, said the scarecrow. We're going to the country of the quadling. But you shall not, replied the voice, and there stepped from behind the rock the strangest man the travelers had ever seen. He was quite short and stout and had a big head, which was flat at the top, supported by a thick neck full of wrinkles. But he had no arms at all, and, seeing this, the scarecrow did not fear that so helpless a creature could prevent them from climbing the hill. So he said, I'm sorry not to do as you wish, but we must pass over your hill, whether you like it or not. And he walked boldly forward. As quick as light, the man's head shot forward, and his neck stretched out until the top of the head, where it was flat, struck the scarecrow in the middle, sent him tumbling over and over down the hill. Almost as quickly as it came, the head went back to the body, and the man laughed harshly as he said, It isn't as easy as you think. A chorus of boisterous laughter came from the other rock, and Dorothy saw hundreds of the armless hammerheads on the hillside one behind every rock. The lion became quite angry at that laughter, caused by the scarecrow's mishap, and giving a loud roar that echoed like thunder, he dashed up the hill. Again, a head shut swiftly out, and the great lion went rolling down the hill as if he had been struck by a cannonball. Dorothy ran down and helped the scarecrow to his feet, and the lion came up to her, feeling rather bruised and sore, and said, It is useless to fight people with shooting heads. No one can withstand them. What can we do then? she asked. All the winged monkeys, suggested the tin woodsman. You have still got the right to command them once more, very well, she answered, and putting on the golden cap, she uttered the magic word. The monkeys were as prompt as ever, and in a few moments the entire band stood before her. What are your commands? inquired the king of the monkeys, bowing low. Carry us over the hill to the country of the quadling, answered the girl. It shall be done, said the king and at once the winged monkeys caught the poor travelers and Toto up in their arms and flew away with them. As they passed over the hill, the hammerheads yelled with vexation and shot their heads high in the air, but they could not reach the winged monkeys, which carried Dorothy and her comrades safely over the hill and set them down in the beautiful country of the quadlings. This is the last time you can summon us, said the leader to Dorothy. So goodbye, and good luck to you. Goodbye, and thank you very much, returned the girl, and the monkeys rose into the air and were out of sight in a twinkle. The country of the quadlings seemed rich and happy. There was a field upon field of ripening grain, 
with well-paved roads running between and pretty rippling brooks with strong bridges across them. Fences and houses and bridges were all painted red, bright red, just as they had been painted yellow in the country of the Winkies and blue in the country of the Munchkins. Swaddlings themselves, who were short and fat and looked chubby and good-natured, were dressed all in red, which showed bright against the green grass and the yellow grain, yellowing grain. The monkeys had set them down near a farmhouse, and the four travelers walked up to it and knocked at the door. It was opened by the farmer's wife, and when Dorothy asked for something to eat, the woman gave them all a good dinner, with three kinds of cake and four kinds of cookies, and a bowl of milk for Toto. How far is it to the castle of Glinda? asked the child. It is not a great way, answered the farmer's wife. Take the road to the south, and you will reach it, soon reach it. Thanking the good woman, they started afresh and walked by the fields and across the pretty bridges until they saw before them a very beautiful castle. Before the gates were three young girls, dressed in handsome red uniform, trimmed with gold braid. And as Dorothy approached, one of them said to her, Why have you come to the south country? To see the good witch who rules here, she answered. Will you take me to her? Let me have your name, and I will ask Glinda if she will receive you. They told who they were, and the girl soldier went into the castle. After a few moments, she came back to say that Dorothy and the others were to be admitted at once. Chapter 23 The Good Witch Grants Dorothy's Wish before they went to see Glinda, however, they were taken to a room of the castle, where Dorothy washed her face and combed her hair, and the lion shook the dust out of his mane, and the scarecrow patted himself into his best shape, and the woodman polished his tin and oiled his joint. When they were all quite presentable, they followed the soldier girl into a big room, where the witch Glinda sat upon a throne of rubies. She was both beautiful and young to see it through their eyes. Her hair was a rich red in color and fell in flowing ringlets over her shoulders. Her dress was pure white, but her eyes were blue, and they looked kindly upon the little girl. What can I do for you, my child? she asked. Dorothy told the witch all her story how the cyclone had brought her to the land of Oz, how she had found her companion, and of the wonderful adventures they had met with. My greatest wish now, she added, is to get back to Kansas. For Aunt Em will surely think something dreadful has happened, and that will make her put on mourning. And unless the crops are better this year than they were last, I'm sure Uncle Henry cannot afford it. Glinda leaned forward and kissed the sweet, upturned face of the loving little girl. Bless you, dear heart, he said. I am sure I can tell you of a way to get back to Kansas. Then she added, But if I do, you must give me the golden cap. Willingly, exclaimed Dorothy. Indeed, it is of no use to me now. And when you have it, you can command the winged monkeys three times. I think I shall need their service for those three times, answered Glinda, smiling. Dorothy then gave her the golden cap, and the witch said to the scarecrow, What will you do when Dorothy has left us? I will return to the Emerald City reply, for Oz has made me its ruler, and the people like me. The only thing that worries me is how to cross the hill of the Hammerhead. 
By means of the golden cap, I shall command the winged monkeys to carry you to the gates of the Emerald City, said Glinda. For it would be a shame to deprive people of so wonderful a ruler. Am I really wonderful? asked the scarecrow. You are unusual, replied Glinda. Turning to the tin woodman, she asked, What will become of you when Dorothy leaves this country? He leaned on his axe and thought a moment. Then he said, The Winkies were very kind to me and wanted me to rule over them after the wicked witch died. I am fond of the Winkies, and if I could get back again to the country of the West, I should like nothing better than to rule over them forever. My second command to the winged monkeys, said Glenda, will be that they carry you safely to the land of the wink. Your brains may not be so large to look at those of the scarecrow, but you are really brighter than he is when you are all well polished, and I am sure you will rule the winkies wisely and well. Then the witch looked at the big shaggy lion and asked, When Dorothy has returned to her own home, what will become of you? Over the hill of the hammerheads, he answered, lies a grand old forest, and all the beasts that lived there have made me their king. If I could only get back to this forest, I would pass my life very happily. My third command to the winged monkey said Glenda, shall be to carry you to the, your forest. Then, having used up the powers of the golden cap, I shall give it to the king of the monkeys, that he and his band may thereafter be free forevermore. The scarecrow and the tin woodman and the lion now thank the good witch earnestly for her kindness. And Dorothy exclaimed, You are certainly as good as you are beautiful, but you have not yet told me how to get back to Kansas. Your silver shoes will carry you over the desert, replied Glinda. If you had known their power, you could have gone back to your Aunt Em the very first day you came to this country. But then I should not have had my wonderful brain, cried the scarecrow. I might have passed my whole life in the farmer's cornfield. And I should not have had my lovely heart, said the tin woodman. I might have stood and rusted in the forest till the end of the world. And I should have lived a coward forever, declared the lion. And no beast in all the forest would have had a good word to say to me. This is all true, said Dorothy. And I am glad I was of use to these good friends. And now that each of them has had what he most desired, and each is happy in having a kingdom to rule beside, I think I should like to go back to Kansas. The silver shoes, said the good witch, have wonderful powers, and one of the most curious things about them is that they can carry you to any place in the world in three steps, and each step will be made in the wink of an eye. All you have to do is to knock the heels together three times and command the shoes to carry you wherever you wish to go. If that is so, said the child jo joyfully, I will ask them to carry me back to Kansas at once. She threw her arms around the lion's neck and kissed it patting his big head tenderly. Then she kissed the tin woodman, who was weeping in a way most dangerous to his joint. But she hugged the soft, stuffed body of the scarecrow in her arms, instead of kissing his face, painted face, and found she was crying herself at this sorrowful parting from her loving comrade. Glinda the Good stepped down from her ruby thorn to give the little girl a goodbye kiss, and Dorothy thanked her 
for all the kindness she had shown to her friends and herself. Dorothy now took Toto up solemnly in her arm, and having said one last goodbye, she clapped the heels of her shoes together three times, saying, Take me home to Aunt Em. Instantly, she was whirling through the air, so swiftly that all she could see or feel was the wind whistling past her ears. The silver shoes took but three steps, and then she stopped so suddenly that she rolled over on the grass several times before she knew where she was. At length, however, she sat up and looked about her. Good gracious, she cried, for she was sitting on the broad Kansas prairie, and just before her was the new farmhouse Uncle Henry built after the cyclone had carried away the old one. Uncle Henry was milking the cows in his barnyard, and Toto had jumped out of her arms and was running toward the barn, barking joyously. Dorothy stood up and found she was in her stocking feet, for the silver shoes had fallen off in her flight through the air and were lost forever in the desert. Chapter 24 Home Again N.M. had just come out of the house to water the cabbages when she looked up and saw Dorothy running toward her. My darling child, she cried, holding the little girl in her arms and covering her face with kisses. Where in the world did you come from? From the land of Oz, said Dorothy gravely. And here is Toto, too. And, oh, Aunt Em, I'm so glad to be at home again. 